Hi, my name is Tamar Moss, and I worked with Dr. Vanda Nakar at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee to study the relationships between socioeconomic vulnerability and urban heat exposure in two American cities. Our research looked at spatial relationships between socioeconomically vulnerable populations and exposure to high urban temperatures in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona during the summer of the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. In this presentation, I will explain what the urban heat island effect is and why it's important to consider. Then I will discuss the methodology we used in our study and our findings and conclusions. To start with, the urban heat island effect describes the phenomenon where urban areas are significantly warmer than their surrounding rural areas. This phenomenon is prevalent worldwide in cities of all different sizes. Three major factors contribute to the UHI effect. First, replacing vegetation with impervious surfaces leads to warming. Plants tend to cool their surroundings by providing shade and through evapotranspiration. So, when vegetated areas become developed, this cooling factor is lost. Additionally, impervious surfaces like asphalt and roofing shingles are usually made from dark colored materials with lower albedos than vegetation, so they absorb more solar radiation, which then increases local temperatures. Second, urban morphology changes local radiation and wind dynamics. Urban street canyons increase local temperature. The impervious surfaces of urban canyons absorb incoming shortwave radiation and re-emit longwave radiation. Rather than escaping back to space, the longwave radiation is bounced off the sides of the urban canyon, which then raises the local temperature. Urban structures also block wind, which typically cools off a city. Lastly, human activities release heat into the atmosphere. For instance, heat is released by both air conditioning and vehicle exhaust. Higher urban temperatures are concerning in terms of public health and energy consumption. Increased temperatures lead to heat stress illness, which can result in anything from dizziness to death. According to the Center for Disease Control, there were more than 28,000 heat stress illness related hospitalizations in 20 states in the U.S. between 2001 and 2020. Also, warmer temperatures resulting from UHI increase building cooling loads which consequently increase energy consumption and electricity cost for homeowners. Increased cooling loads are also concerning because they can lead to brownouts, where electricity use increases across the city and utility companies cannot produce enough electricity in real time. This further prevents people from having access to air conditioning and heat refuge. The UHI effect is exacerbated by climate change and by increasing urbanization. Climate change increases baseline temperatures and leads to more frequent and severe heat waves. There is also something cyclical about higher energy consumption and climate change. As climate change raises baseline temperatures and leads to more heat waves, people use more energy to cool their homes. More often than not, this energy is generated by fossil fuel combustion, which then gives off carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas that further contributes to climate change. Urbanization is also important to consider because it increases the number of people affected by high temperatures and the magnitude of the UHI effect in the first place. Right now, more than half of the world's population lives in cities, and the UN predicts that this statistic will rise to two-thirds by 2050. This means that not only will more people be affected by UHI, but there will also be more urban growth, which increases the magnitude of the UHI effect. There are additional concerns about heat exposure and equity due to the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. Lockdown orders, school closures, increased unemployment, and increased remote work have kept more people at home, allowing for greater potential exposure to home temperatures. There are also some populations that are disproportionately impacted by both heat-related illnesses and COVID-19 risks. In the United States, the CDC identifies that many of the socioeconomic groups with increased vulnerability to heat exposure, such as elderly, Hispanic, and Black populations, 
are also at higher risk of experiencing heat-related illnesses. Our study looked at both Phoenix, Arizona and Dallas, Texas because both these cities have high population density. Both are located in the Sun Belt, where there are predicted to be more intense and extreme heat events, and both were hotspots for COVID-19 during June 2020. Although air temperature is more indicative of the human experience of heat, we used land surface temperature from satellite data to calculate the urban heat island intensity, or UHII. For our study, we needed temperature data at high spatial resolutions in order to be able to compare interurban temperatures at the block level. We use temperature data from satellite images because they provide data at much higher resolutions than available urban air temperature sensors. We selected cloud-free Landsat 8 images from June 2020 for each city. We converted digital numbers from band 10, the thermal infrared band, into Fahrenheit and then mosaiced images together as needed. Next, we calculated the UHII by subtracting the maximum land surface temperature at each pixel from the maximum land surface temperature of each urban area, as defined by boundaries from the U.S. Census Bureau. We then reclassified the UHII into five classes using Jenks Natural Breaks classification. As you can see from the images shown here, the land surface temperature in reclassified UHII maps are very similar. Also, in order to look at the spatial distributions of urban greenery, we used bands 4 and 5, the red and near-infrared bands, to calculate Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. Next, we determined socioeconomic vulnerability based on most recent data from the U.S. Census Bureau. The variables we looked at were populations younger than 14, older than 60, unemployed, black, Hispanic, living in rented homes, and people with annual incomes below $25,000 a year. The 2018 census data is at the census tract and census block group level. Since we were interested in comparing our variables with more precision, we used a decimetric mapping approach to disaggregate the 2018 socioeconomic data to the census block level. We did this by creating a population binary using population data at the census block level from 2010. We then multiplied the density of each socioeconomic variable by the population binary, and then calculated the total of each variable per block using zonal statistics. Finally, we calculated the percent of each socioeconomic variable per block. Since we were interested in comparing overall vulnerability, we created a stacked vulnerability index. We used Jenks Natural Breaks classification to reclassify the percentages of each variable into five classes, where one represents the lowest vulnerability and five represents the highest. We used an equal weights approach to stack all the reclassified vulnerability values to create our socioeconomic vulnerability index. I will now briefly go over some of our findings. In the map shown, the left box in each map represents Tarrant County, with the center of Fort Worth indicated by the left point in the top left image. The right box of each map represents Dallas County, with the center of Dallas indicated by the right point in the top left image. In Dallas, it is clear that the land surface temperature increases with proximity to the downtown areas of Dallas and Fort Worth, and corresponds to areas with low vegetation, as seen from the NDVI map. It is also evident that areas with the highest percent of socioeconomically vulnerable populations are also located in these downtown areas. The findings for Phoenix were similar. Phoenix is particularly interesting because it almost has a reverse UHI effect due to the fact that the surrounding rural area is actually partially a desert. The urban areas tend to be cooler than the surrounding desert, potentially due to planted urban vegetation as indicated by the NDVI map. Despite this, it is still evident that the urban core of Phoenix is warmer than its immediate surroundings. The metropolitan area of Phoenix is shown in the oval in the left image. Like for Daleks, the percent of socioeconomically vulnerable populations increases with proximity to Phoenix's urban core. 
This slide shows findings from bivariate Morin's eye analysis for Phoenix. The dark red and dark blue areas of the spatial autocorrelation map shown on top indicates the relationship between high vulnerability and high land surface temperature and low vulnerability and low land surface temperature, respectively. Corresponding shades of dark green are shown in the significance map. This indicates significant spatial relationships between vulnerability and heat exposure in Phoenix. In this presentation, we have shown that for both Dallas and Phoenix, socioeconomic vulnerability tends to increase with proximity to urban centers where there is less vegetation and the urban heat island intensity is higher. This leads us to believe that heat mitigation initiatives and cooling refuge placements should target urban centers as these areas have the highest heat exposure and the most vulnerable populations. Given the overlap between populations most at risk of COVID-19 impacts and heat-related illnesses, plans for COVID-19 testing locations and vaccination sites should also strategically target these areas. I hope that you now have a better understanding of what the urban heat island effect is and why it's important to consider, especially in light of heat equity in the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for listening.